I will give the floor first of all to Professor Kawar Qureshi, and I will remind him that we have 20 minutes for each speaker. Professor Qureshi, you have the floor. Judge Youssef, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and honor to join you uh, for this uh, webinar where we are hoping to identify the issues that continue to vex African states and African parties in the context of a very important area uh, of activity, namely bilateral investment treaty disputes arbitration. The format of the presentation will cover bilateral investment treaties and then also address the way in which bilateral investment treaties affect African states. Now, what I'm about to say in the introduction is probably familiar to many of you, but bilateral investment treaties are used by investors to protect against the risk element of investment. They can also use contractual provisions, sovereign guarantees, bank guarantees, and insurance. Bilateral investment treaties began their life uh, in uh, more than a century ago, but the first recorded bilateral investment treaty was of 1959 between Germany and Pakistan. There are over 3,000 bilateral investment treaties in existence at present, and they can sometimes be underpinned by a multilateral regime, such as the Energy Charter Treaty, a regional free trade agreement such as the NAFTA agreement, or a mechanism for dispute resolution as provided by the United Nations body, ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, which is housed in Washington and came into existence in 1966. Now, what is the purpose, as I indicated, the purpose ostensibly is to provide foreign investors with a level playing field where the state, the host state, promises the home state that it will not use its sovereign power with detrimental effect to the foreign investor. Now, the presentation I'm sharing with you now is a very condensed version of a much more detailed presentation where I will take you through the standard clauses in many BITs and the example I will uh, I've provided in the more detailed presentation, which will be shared with you, is from the China-Nigeria Bilateral Investment Treaty, which came into effect in February 2010. There are eight aspects of bilateral investment treaties that I want to highlight for you. And most of these are similar in all of the 3000 treaties with slight variations. The first and critical aspect is what qualifies as an investment? There are various decisions of investment treaty tribunals that have considered this question, bearing in mind that one of the major advantages of a bilateral investment treaty is that it enables the foreign investor to go straight to an international arbitral tribunal where the foreign investor appoints one arbitrator, the state, so long as it understands the process, and I'll come to that shortly, appoints an arbitrator. The proceedings take place, often five years, six years elapse. There are challenges to jurisdiction, to arbitrators increasingly. The arbitrators may decide on a question of jurisdiction. And if it's within a framework such as ICSID, there may be an attempt to annul that challenge, uh, that, that uh, decision. There may be challenges to the arbitrators as to whether or not they're independent and impartial. And then there may be a determination on liability. Has there been a breach attributable to the state, which leads to quantum? What qualifies in, as an investment? It's a very broad definition, every kind of asset. And then you'll see in investment treaties that there are some examples of assets, including shares, uh, concessions. Who qualifies as an investor? 
the treaty will define an investor as a natural person, a national or a legal person. Now, much has been made of the fact that some states are being used to springboard, to provide a way into a state because they have a bilateral investment treaty in place between themselves and a host state. And simply setting up a company which costs very little without a commercial presence or business activity seems unfair. But in many of these treaties, there is no requirement for presence or commercial activity. Is that an abuse or not? Well, I leave that for you to consider, but it's a reflection of the way in which this area has developed. And coming to the first point that Judge Yusuf very, very rightly highlighted, and it's the underlying theme of this presentation, it's a regret on my part, unfortunately, in my 32 years of practice, having represented many African states and also appeared against them for foreign investors, that time and time again, even now, I'm acting for three African states, there is a lack of engagement with the agreements, whether it's a contract or a treaty that the state binds itself by. As a matter of international law, uh, ignorance is no excuse. It's the same for domestic law. And um, that really needs to change. There is no excuse. For decades, we have been able to access learning. And um, now that we're speaking to all of you on the internet, there simply is not no excuse for state authorities, state attorneys to fail to acquaint themselves with the fundamentals so that when they sign an agreement or when they enter into a treaty, they understand the consequences. So those are the definitions. There are, in essence, three, uh, two key elements of protection. One is identified as the fair and equitable treatment standard. What does that mean? It means that the legitimate expectations of an investor should not be undermined by the state by changing the law, the regulatory framework. There ought to be transparency, non-discrimination between the investor and nationals. The state's judicial framework ought not to deny justice. That in essence is fair and equitable treatment. Another standard is expropriation. When, after the Second World War, there was a spate of nationalization, the states in certain uh, countries uh, sought to take back control of assets that former colonial powers had appropriated to themselves. They believed that they were entitled to do so because these were national assets which were subject to the sovereignty of the state. When they were taken back, the foreign entities, often created by the colonial states, cried expropriation. And it is in the context of such cries that bilateral investment treaties were developed. In fact, it was in the 1950s, the nationalization of what was called Anglo-Iranian oil company by the Iranian government, that the UK Foreign Office made moves to develop uh, bilateral investment treaties, then reflected in 1959, by the German government and its BIT with uh, Pakistan. There are two types of expropriation, direct, where the state effectively takes over the assets, very few and far between. And there's indirect called creeping expropriation. Now expropriation is permitted so long as it's accompanied by prompt, adequate, effective compensation. In the absence of compensation, it's unlawful. How is the compensation to be calculated? It's the open market value of the asset just prior to expropriation plus interest. A most favored nation clause, in essence, allows an investor who is taking advantage of an investment treaty between their home state and the host state to look at other treaties entered into by the host state, which may contain greater protection and in essence, cut and paste those provisions into the treaty between their home state and the host state. 
and they can be a, a, a cause of great surprise to a state. And my first ever bilateral investment treaty case was in 1995 for a Greek national when I was only three years in practice where we were looking at most favored nation clauses in other treaties to take advantage of them against the Ethiopian government for the foreign investor. And it came as quite a surprise that this could be done in the 1990s, but it's now established, uh, subject to the state, the, the consent of the state being manifest to allow the most favored nation clause to be imported in this manner. What is an umbrella clause? It's not to protect you against a rainy day, an umbrella clause, if it is a part of an investment treaty, it says something to the effect that the state shall honor its obligations. That has been interpreted by bilateral investment treaty tribunals to mean that where the state has directly or through one of its emanations entered into a contract, a breach of the contract is elevated into a treaty breach. It doesn't matter that the contract can, includes its own dispute resolution provisions before the domestic courts or other courts, it becomes a treaty breach. The dispute resolution clause of the contract is critical. This will provide for arbitration, typically ICSID, UNCITRAL, and may also contain a negotiation provision. And then the last two points, damages. How are they calculated? The damages can be substantial. The biggest claim that's uh, at the present moment being the subject of vigorous challenge by Russia involves a 55 billion dollar award against the Russian Federation in the context of the UCOS uh, issue where uh, an oil company and its assets were allegedly taken unlawfully by the Russian Federation. Now that is in contrast to what was in 2003, the biggest ever claim brought against a state that was for $7 billion against India, all about a power plant brought by General Electric and Bechtel US companies where I had the privilege to represent the Indian government, and that was in 2003. Seven billion, we settled it for about 100 million, and then 55 billion in 2014, an award against Russian Federation. There are in many contracts, clauses called stabilization clauses and renegotiation clauses, in essence, to try and prevent the state from uh, changing the tax laws, the regulatory law, stabilization clauses, renegotiation clauses, in the event that the state changes the contract to the detriment of the foreign investor, um, a requirement to negotiate, renegotiate in good faith. Now, arbitrations with African states and state ent uh, entities, the point that I want to refer to next. And before I do so, I wholeheartedly agree with the observation of Judge Yusuf. Now, we're very, I consider myself very fortunate, and I believe we're all very fortunate and privileged that we have Judge Yusuf sitting in the International Court of Justice as a shining example of how Africa can engage the most effectively, uh, most effectively with international law. And I just hope that the presence of Judge Yusuf will inspire many more of you to embrace learning when it comes to international law uh, arbitration uh, so that Africa does not continue to be disadvantaged in terms of representation at the, the, the level of arbitrators or at the level of counsel. Uh, Africa as we'll see when I take you through the slides, features significantly in investment treaty disputes, features significantly in commercial arbitrations, but is woefully inadequately represented. Now, in the 1990s, there were around four or five cases per year before ICSID. That then ex exploded in around 2010 to 44. In 2020, 54 cases, literally one a week registered, in the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, mostly arising out of bilateral investment treaties. And so far, there have been around 178 ICSID arbitrations against African states. That's a fifth of the total. And when we look at the caseload of ICSID, we are hovering around a fifth to a quarter of all investment treaty disputes before ICSID involving African states, yet, and uh, Middle East and uh, North African states and Sub-Saharan African states. Yet, astonishingly, despite a quarter of the arbitrations involving those states, 
only four to six percent of the arbitrators are from Africa. Now, this is lamentable from my perspective, because one of the virtues of arbitration, as is extolled, is that it is meant to address international issues. It's meant to provide a comfort zone for parties, international parties, and address the needs of the users. Now, if a quarter of the arbitrations, bilateral investment treaty arbitrations, involve African states, it simply is unacceptable that there are less than 5% of the arbitrators from Africa. How on earth can the uh, understanding and the context of Africa, the difficulties that Africa has faced post the colonial era, the uh, lack of resources, the lack of development in this area be understood by arbitral tribunals, largely comprised of lawyers from North America, Northern Europe, uh, for whom using the internet, being able to engage with people swiftly, efficiently is commonplace. Not being able to understand that internet access is very limited, that documentation is not recorded and retained in the way that it could and should be. How are they supposed to understand the cultural context, the pressure that exists to uh, rush to sign a contract because of the eagerness to invite foreign investors, the lack of due diligence, the lack of proper uh, uh, scrutiny of foreign investors. How are they supposed to understand that? The astonishing rate of return that is available to these investors in the extractive industry sector and in the infrastructure development that's taking place in Africa. Now, in 2017, ICSID produced an Africa-specific report which showed that almost 80% of the investors in Africa were non-African. And more than half of the arbitration claims that were brought were successful in whole or part in terms of claims against African states. Now that is very, very important. That means that more than 10% of the claims that are brought against African states succeed in a finding of liability. What are the key issues, the issue, the, the, the point that I want to be able to um, con conclude on in the time that's available for African states? And in, in my view, there are, there are eight in the way that Judge Yusuf has quite rightly uh, flagged up and we must remind ourselves. There are challenges representing states and state entities wherever they may be from. I've represented around 70, including the UK government, the US government, Russian government, African government. At the moment, I'm representing three African states. I've got a hearing in 10 days for an African state before the English courts on a very large arbitration. And the problems that I see from African states are essentially magnified in terms of inability to uh, deal with deadlines, inability to engage in due diligence, review of documentation. And that all plays out very badly before arbitral tribunals. So first point, contract drafting phase. Is the state going to be made a party to the contract? Will it waive its immunity? Is it going to be bound by confidentiality? A point that Judge Yusuf made. Many of these arbitration uh, agreements insist on confidentiality. In the investment treaty context, confidentiality is less of a problem. But in commercial arbitration, most of the, most of the arbitrations take place in comfortable five-star hotels. And the awards are subject to confidentiality. Even when they're challenged, there are requirements of confidentiality. Now, is that right, where hundreds of millions of dollars may be awarded to a foreign investor, and it's the nationals of the state that suffer? How is the state selecting counsel? Is it right that it always selects large international law firms, which with respect, and I've worked with all of them, are not interested in capacity building? And my own objective, I'm acting for the Kenyan government at the moment before the Kenyan courts on a constitutional matter. I believe passionately that it's my responsibility to engage in capacity building. So when I'm appointed as a counsel for foreign states, I make it a point to work with the local lawyers, the government lawyers, in the hope that in some way, shape or form, whether it's through training, actual training, or just sharing knowledge with them, that capacity building can take place. So it's vital that you select counsel in a way in which you can build capacity for your own state, and that you select counsel who are competent for the issue in question, as opposed to counsel that will be decimated by a very experienced international team. Arbitrators, why are you selecting your arbitrator? They must be independent, impartial, credible. The procedure, 
Do you understand the procedure, the disclosure obligations? Please do not fall foul of your disclosure obligations. If you have not retained documents, this will be interpreted as withholding documents. Corruption allegations are increasingly commonplace in international arbitrations. There may be much uh, cause for allegations to be raised, but time and time again, the state authorities, for whatever reason, fail to deliver the evidence. Don't forget that now claimants are often having recourse to third party funders, essentially businesses that stand behind claimants to push through a claim as aggressively as possible. And last but by no means least, one of the benefits of arbitration is the ease with which arbitration awards can be enforced against commercial assets of states. That means your revenues from uh, sales of your uh, natural resources, your commercial assets, your civilian airplanes, your ships, your properties. So please do not um, believe that somehow you can bury your head in the sand, ostrich-like. These arbitrations have fundamentally serious consequences for you, as I've seen, acting for foreign investors, freezing assets of states. I just want to give you two case studies, just very recent, an ICSID case against Gambia, July 2020, a, an attempt to challenge the appointment of an arbitrator by ICSID. Gambia failed to engage with ICSID. There was a time period, a timeline within which Gambia had to appoint its own arbitrator. It didn't, despite having been warned, to, despite having received formal notification from ICSID and the claimant. Once the arbitrator was appointed, Gambia cried, foul, this is unfair. Too late, ICSID said. You had an opportunity, you were aware, you didn't engage. Now you're stuck with an arbitrator that ICSID has appointed for you. That, is, that cannot be right. But of course, Gambia having signed up to the investment treaty and the ICSID process, it's taken to have accepted the potential for ICSID to appoint an arbitrator. Another example, Sierra Leone versus SL Mining, a hopeless challenge was brought to the jurisdiction of the arbitrators before the English courts. And the judge concluded that the challenge was obviously unarguable. Now, having challenged the arbitrators on jurisdiction in an obviously unarguable manner, once that arbitration proceeds, will the arbitrator's mindset be affected by this hopeless challenge? Whenever you appear before a court, whether it's the international court, a domestic court, or an arbitral tribunal, always remember the power lies with the decision maker. And if you are challenging the decision makers in a hopeless manner, they're human beings you're likely to create a perception, whether that's right or wrong, to try and negate that perception is difficult. Concluding observations. The fact that states are increasingly active on the commercial plane means that there's more and more arbitration. It's the default process for dispute resolution for foreign investors. It is absolutely vital for those who are acting for African states and state entities to navigate the arbitral process effectively. They're not doing so. And how can we achieve that? A very strong proactive effort is necessary to build capacity within all African states, to ensure that they understand international law, arbitration, investment treaty arbitration, and that they are properly represented both at the arbitrator platform and council in international arbitration. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share these thoughts with you.